hearts and minds, God. We love you. We trust you. We ask all these things in your son's name. Amen. Amen. Thanks, brother. It's been a wonderful morning in worship, hasn't it, so far? Let's keep going. Uh, so, uh, 1 Corinthians 7, we are in our third sermon out of one chapter, and I uh, hope it's been edifying and building up for you, and we have been uh, now focusing in on the topic of singleness, and all of us in this room have, uh, are single right now, or we know somebody that is single, um, and there is a lot of bad advice for people that are single, <laughs> right? Um, if you, maybe you've experienced some of that now in your context, or you've experienced that before, and we all need to hear from the Lord on this important topic, so as we dive in right from the start, I, w- I just want to just put before you that we're going we're gonna to think about this in, in three different sections as we see it in chapter 7. So uh, I think it's helpful to think about this as a single gift, followed by a single contentment, and then lastly, we'll look at a single purpose. So first, a single gift. Uh, in verses 6 through 9, Paul gives us uh, his view on singleness in a passage that we studied about a couple of weeks ago. Right? You'll remember this is extremely sexually immoral culture uh, that they're living in, and Paul's reminding us that one of the things marriage does is that it guards us against sexual immorality uh, because it is the one relationship that God has defined sexual experience to take place in. However, uh, let's, let's look back at those verses to what Paul has to say about singleness there also. He says this, Now as a concession, not a command, I say this, I wish that all were as I myself am, which in this context we know to be unmarried or single, and he continues, but each has his own gift from God, one of one kind and one of another. To the unmarried and the widow I say that it is good for them to remain single as I am, but if they cannot exercise self-control, they should marry for it is better to marry than to burn with passion. So, so let's summarize some of what Paul just said about singleness, right? He says, I wish that all were single in verse 7. Then he says, singleness is a gift from God. He, he, re, he reiterates in verse 8 that it is good for them to remain single. And then in verse 9, he basically says, only become married if you can't control yourself, Okay. So we're going to put some disqualifiers behind this and some context behind this, rather, not disqualifiers. We're going to disqualify the the scripture this morning. Um, What an awful way to start the sermon. So we're going to we're going to build out some context behind what Paul means when he says this. But from the from the right from the start, the first thing we have to see is that singleness is a gift from God that must be treasured. You see, now. You remember, Paul is is speaking to a specific people at a specific time that have asked him specific questions about sexuality and marriage and all this kind of stuff. And like we mentioned a second ago, there is is rampant sexual immorality taking place in marriages, outside of marriages, and he is just, like, like it is a dumpster fire in the church of Corinth, okay? And Paul is trying to rein these people in here. So some of his phrases could, could, could come off sounding harsh and to the point, maybe even a little over the top, but he is, he is trying to wrangle them in and get control of a sinful people. However, that doesn't mean that there aren't great biblical truths here for us to understand. But from the beginning, I'd like to put a couple notes out Uh, on how we should approach this text to help with our understanding and our interpretation of this chapter. The first thing I want you to know is that it is right and good to have a desire to want to be married, okay? This is a a relationship designed by God. So if if you're single with us this morning, please hear this from the start, that nothing in this text from Paul or in this sermon is is meant to make you feel bad about the desire to be married or to even sway you away from being married. Because in many ways, Paul is actually talking about the goodness of marriage once we get behind some of these words. Instead, see this as as life-giving counsel in this state of singleness that you're in, that, that, God, that God would have you to live out your singleness. And that's, again, that's whether or not you desire to be married or not. So second, we want to be sensitive here because there are several reasons for singleness, even amongst us in our faith family, right? So this could be by your choice. For some of us, we have chosen to be single, at least for now. But some of us, we have not chosen to be single. Some of, some of the tragedies in our lives that maybe you have faced, like, like losing a spouse or maybe even divorce. So there's heartbreak and tragedy that can, that can bring this around, but there's also different, different ways that you can look at yourself, right? You might, you might find yourself as an encouraged single this morning, 
And maybe you are encouraged in your walk with the Lord this morning. Maybe if you're honest with yourself and you're, you're single here amongst us, you would explain yourself as more of a discouraged single. But before we go any further, I wanted you to hear this from me. God isn't saying your life experiences or what has gone on around you to make you single in these moments is the gift. Far from that. What he's saying is singleness itself is a gift. And that is from the God that, that sees you and loves you and cares about you so much. So we are challenged to view our singleness in this way and not necessarily the, the circumstances and situations that have led us into that. But many of us do need to hear this today, that singleness is a blessing and a gift that should be treasured. It is not unnatural. It is not less than God's design for you. And it is not a step behind or away from marriage in any way. David Platt says this, Singleness is not a state to be endured while you wait on something better. You see, my prayer today that this is life-giving for you and that you can see that God is speaking to you. The person that knows you best is wanting to love you most in these moments when he says singleness is a gift that I've given to you. See, but we do pause to say that doesn't mean that's not going to come with some stuff, Right? It's not going to come with some hard emotions. It doesn't mean it's not going to come with difficulties at times that you repeatedly will need to take to the foot of Jesus to release all those to him, just like it does for any of us facing any circumstance, right? So it is right and good to admit when we are struggling and we need some help and we lean into our faith family. So let me summarize the warning here and then we'll keep going. This is for those of us that are unmarried or married, challenging our view of singleness. We must see and treat singleness like it is the good gift. It is not less than marriage. It is not some backup plan, but instead it is a good gift from a good God that loves you better than anybody else could. And a quick note, quick family discipleship note for those of you in the room that are parents. Do not say with your words or with your actions, do not communicate in any way to your kids that marriage is a success and singleness is some kind of failure. Because it's not. It is not. It is a good gift from the Lord. You're going to set your kids up for so much heartache in the future if this is you. So be careful, parents, shepherding the hearts of your kids. But where is Paul getting this idea that singleness is a gift straight to you? Kirby read the verses 17 through 24 a minute ago, so we're not going to go through all those again. However, we saw that God calls and assigns us to specific situations in life, and this would include singleness. See, all of us in the room have a specific calling and assignment in your life because God has sovereignly and purposefully designed it that way. Because he has specific plans for you and purposes for you. You're not single by accident, married by accident. You don't work where you work by accident. You don't live in the neighborhood that you live by accident. You don't frequent the grocery store that you do by accident and so forth. Let me show you where this is coming from. Again, this you might not be able to read all of this from your seats. If you can, you're y- probably younger than me or you've paid for better eyes. Uh, but notice within these eight verses, this is only eight verses. And within here, remember what we talk about in our Bible studies? When you start seeing things being repeated, you should be circling, underlining, starring, trying to figure out what is going on. And within eight verses, Paul gives the same instruction about embracing our assignment three times in three different ways. But he uses the word called eight times within eight verses. And here's the overarching point, a little summary that I wrote based on what Kirby read read a moment ago. God calls you into life with him in the gospel. So in that sense, you are called, right? And we get that. But in another sense, you're called to live the life that he has placed right before you. And in that sense, you're also called. And for that calling, the sovereign God of the universe assigned you to particular life situations and circumstances for his sovereign reasons. See, this is how you can be confident that if you are single or married in this room, that this is God's good gift to you. He designed it just for you and his purposes. See, for the rest of us, the context that God has placed you in right now is also not meaningless. Like we said a moment ago, this is not only about singleness, but this is also about living as we were called wherever he has us. Whatever work situation we are in or or living situation, the context that he has placed you in is for a reason, and he has put you right where he wants you for such a time as this. 
So since God calls and since God assigns, we must embrace our life and remain faithful where God has us. You and I must embrace our life and remain faithful where God has us. See, Paul is calling us to step into faithfulness and obedience wherever that is, whether we are single, whether we are married, and whatever context that we're living in. And we need to hear this because why? Have you ever noticed that we are the grass is always greener kind of people? Yeah. Right? Like because of your sinful flesh longing to be satisfied in Christ, sometimes that is mass, and we begin to think that anything else can satisfy us. And it's always the next best thing. See, and if we're not on guard, we're going we're gonna to do that with singleness. We're going to do that with our marriage. We're going to do that with anywhere in any context that we have in life. And we will always be on the lookout for what is next or what is best or what we think we need. See, some of us are living our lives this way. And hear me. It is exhausting, and it is stealing your joy. This is why Paul is using some of the language he's using. The context in the church at Corinth is that they were the grass is always greener kind of people. You see, and because of some of the hard truths they're faced with, because of some of the situations around it, see, there were people in marriages that just knew the grass was going to be greener if they got divorced. There were people struggling with rampant sexual immorality because they knew the grass would be greener and they would get fulfillment in these sexual experiences. And there are those that are single in the church and they are convinced that the grass is greener in marriage. When all the while, Paul is not saying, don't get married, don't get engaged, don't seek somebody, but he is saying, stop. He's saying, slow down. What you think you are craving is a lie. Because what your soul is craving is me. Because I am the lover of your soul. I am the only one that can satisfy you. So take a closer look at two of the ways Paul gives us specific instructions. Uh, For those of you where your eyes weren't as good as everybody else's and you couldn't see them. Uh, Verses 17 and 20 says this. Only let each person lead the life. Lead the life that the Lord has assigned him and to which God has called him. This is my rule in all the churches. So you see that there might be some distress, there might be some chaos going on in this church that's leading him to speak some specific ways, but what's his, what, what is his message to all churches? Lead the life that the Lord has assigned to you. Be faithful in that. Embrace it. Walk in that, right? Verse 20, he words it a little bit differently and say, it's saying the same thing. Each one should remain in the condition in which he was called. The point is, is that after you see that God has called you and assigned you into specific situations, it is your response to embrace and live faithfully wherever he has you for his glory. So you don't doubt God's plans. Instead, you lead the life that he has assigned. So what does this mean? This means that we can't constantly look for changes or try to force things in our lives. Said differently, we must be content in our assignment and in our calling. See, when we are not content, we are just wishing away the good gift that God has given us. And you are missing out on so much joy and so much blessing of his calling. What does contentment look like, though? See, verse 21 gives us what we would say is maybe an extreme example of what contentment in life looks like. Verse 21, Paul says that you were a bondservant when saved. Well, don't be concerned about that. That seems quite odd, does it not, right? Like, like if you were a bond servant at that time, yes, it may have been slightly different than, than we're thinking of as it was here in America, and some people were actually better off in that way, but still, you were enslaved to someone, right? So in general, this is not a great thing, and Paul says, oh, were you a bond servant when God called you to him and Jesus? Don't worry about that, okay? And then after saying that, he says, but if you gain your freedom, about yourself the opportunity, Right? So what's he saying? Think about that with me. Paul is saying, don't be so concerned with your earthly situation that it distracts you from your primary calling and purpose in this life. Paul is saying, don't get so caught up in changing that what is going on around you that you completely miss on what God is desiring to do within you and around you. Now, if you long, if along the way, you find some ways to be comforted in this life that are, that are pleasing to God. Paul says, well, don't pass those up, right? Like those are, gifts, those are good gifts from God too. He's just saying, you walk in faithfulness. You walk to your primary calling. You, you live out your primary purpose and take the good gifts that God gives along the way. But don't let them consume you. 
Because if not, that is what you will begin to obsess over. And there's a difference in that, right? And what is the difference? It's contentment. It is contentment. Because it, being at peace wherever we are means that you really trust God's plans are good and best for you. If you have a lack of contentment in your life, you may just doubt whether God's plans are really good and really best for your life. See, for singles, this could mean that we don't obsess over becoming married, but instead we, we trust God in His perfect timing to find the spouse if He sees fit. It doesn't mean you ignore the situations that are coming in front of you or, or the instances for dating and, and in the areas of interest that might hit you, but you don't come to consume with trying to force things yourself because for singles, where's the danger in that? The danger is that you've tempted to date or marry somebody that is unequally yoked from you. And you end up settling for less than God's best for your life. See, in verse 39 gives us the requirement for marriage, but also for dating. Because dating is leading to marriage, right? It says, a wife is bound to her husband as long as she lives. <laughs> Would be bad news for some of us. Um, but, but if her husband dies, she is free to marry to whom she wishes. How? Only in the Lord. Only in the Lord. So to even be in consideration for dating or marriage, they must be in the Lord. And if you are single, please hear this. Make sure you're obedient where God has you in your singleness and only consider dating and marriage if you find yourself confronted with a man or woman that is passionately and obediently following Jesus. And remember, if they're not marriage material, they're not dating material. We have a saying in the business world, we should be slow to hire and quick to fire. We should be slow to find the right fit for the role that we're looking for. And when they prove us foolish and we've made a mistake, we should be quick to get rid of them. You should take that same approach to your dating life. See, settling for less than God's best and marriage will lead to much more problems than a singleness could ever bring to your life. So for all of us, whether we're single and married, this also applies to any other context that we could be talking about. Flee the desire to, to pursue worldly treasures and pleasures or achievements or neighborhoods or jobs or vacations or more kids or whatever else it is, right? Like you are always going to be seeking and going. And in the end, all those are just distractions of your flesh stopping you from being obedient right where God has you. And it is also robbing you of your joy and your blessing. See, one final note for us that's hard to hear but we must see our lives through this lens is that what God wants for you and from you is more important than what you want for yourself. And that's hard to hear, right? So you might not be desiring a bad thing, but misplaced priorities are still sinful. Look at what Paul says in verse 19. For neither circumcision counts for anything nor uncircumcision, but keeping the commandments of God. See, no status or achievement in life ultimately matters, but only pleasing the Lord and doing what He wills for our lives. He models this well in verse 22 whenever he says, For he who is called in the Lord as a bondservant is a freed man of the Lord. Likewise, likewise, he who was free when called is a bondservant of Christ. If you are in Christ, you belong to Him. You are His, and you should live for Him. See, but we know that none of this comes naturally and easy, don't we? Like nothing that we're talking about comes naturally and easily. So fortunately for us, this passage also gives us the reason that we can be equipped to live out our assignments and our callings in our life. And this would be in the second section that I talked about, a single contentment. I believe the main principle from, from this section that we could get that Paul is, is saying could be summarized like this. We must find our contentment in Christ so we can be free from anxiety and live faithfully. See, it is not just enough to know that you need to be content in your circumstances or in your situations, but we must also remind ourselves that Jesus is the only source of true contentment. You see, and that sounds like really churchy and easy, doesn't it? But how often can you feel your flesh wandering from him in order to seek things of this world, including even good gifts, right? We've already talked about the desire to leave singleness or for some of these other good things in your life are not in and of themselves bad, but it's when we seek them for our contentment. See, earlier I mentioned in 17 through 24, Paul gave the same counsel three times. If you were paying attention or taking notes, you noticed that we only discussed 
two of those. So uh, we're going to look at the third one, and you'll actually see like Paul's progression of thought as, as we do this. So verse 17 said, only let each person lead the life that the Lord has assigned to him. Verse 20 we saw said, each one should remain in the condition in which he was called. And then look at 24. So brothers, in whatever condition each was called there, let him remain how? With God. See, Paul says, lead the life God gave you. Paul says, remain faithful in your situation. And then Paul reminds us the only way that you can do this is by remaining with God, by walking day by day, step by step, hand in hand with the only Savior who's emptied himself to love you and serve you. Because in him is abundant and everlasting joy. But life walking with Jesus is not only where we experience true life and joy. Paul would also pin these words of Galatians 5.16 that say this, but I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. Then ASB says, or carry out the desires of the flesh. You don't want to carry out the desires of the flesh. You don't want to walk in sin. You don't want to be caught up in discontentment. How do you do it? You walk by the Spirit. So we see that remaining with God also equips us. It also equips us to have the power to live this content life no matter the circumstances we face. This was actually the entire motivation behind the, the, the famous Pauline text that's so often abused of Philippians, Philippians 4, 11 through 13. It says this, Not that I'm speaking of being in need, for I have learned in whatever situation I am to be content. I know how to be brought low and how to abound. In any and every circumstance, I have learned the secret of facing plenty and hunger, abundance and need. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. See, for Paul and for us, the text is crying out the secret of embracing whatever life situation or circumstance we find ourselves in is only found in the abundant life and power in Christ. And that is the lens that we must live our life through. You see, the application here seems simple, but we must seek to be filled in Christ daily so we do not seek contentment in anything or any one of this world. And this is a daily pursuit. So if you are single and you are unmarried amongst us, the only way for you to embrace that in a way that is pleasing to God is to fully and passionately give yourself over to Jesus every single day, day by day. Also, if your assignment in life brings anxiety or worry or fear or any other unhealthy emotions, only Jesus can free you from those and bring you peaceful contentment to your soul. Do we all not long for peaceful contentment? I'll give you a hint. Yeah, you do, right? And there's only one place to find it. So if you are not single, the only way for you, it's, it's the same call this morning, the only way for you not to be chasing the next best thing, the next job, the next promotion, the next thing with your family, the next achievements, the next financial goal that you have for yourself, the next neighborhood that you want to move to, the next this, the next this, is to find yourself falling in love with daily your first love. And you remember it was never your wife or your husband in the first place. It was never your kids or your job. It was always Jesus. It was always him. See, one final note, particularly for those of us that say we would struggle with loneliness. We must primarily be content in Christ, yes. But this text also calls us to see that we can seek contentment in the body of Christ. You see, we must never forget that Paul was a single man, yet he had many spiritual children that he spoke of with the love and tenderness of a father. And he had love for brothers and sisters and fathers and mothers in the faith that, saint, that made many earthly familiar relationships seem distant and cold. See, the truth that the adversary does not want you to latch on to is that no one is ever truly alone in our faith family. And this is something I hope you lean into, whether you are married or unmarried. Because maybe you find yourself married and desiring kids, but you're still in waiting. Or maybe yours are out of the house and you realize that you're lonely in those ways, you really can be filled by being spiritual mother, fathers, aunts, uncles, and grandparents. See, if you're unmarried and desiring a spouse, see the joy that exudes from Paul throughout his life in Scripture and know that the same love and joy awaits you in your true bridegroom, Jesus. 
to be vulnerable. If this is something you struggle with with those that are close to you, so that they can remind you of these truths when they seem so far away. And one warning from the text that we all must have, all of us in this room, is we must not seek contentment and sexual intimacy outside of marriage. We're not going to cover this in depth because we have gone over this, but I wanted to address this briefly because as Pastor Matt Chandler put it, it says, when he says this of sexual temptation and singleness, there is a lie of the world that says to be fully alive and fulfilled, there must be sexual expression and sexual experience in your life. Friends, this is, this is a lie of the world that either paralyzes you or destroys you, and it destroys many marriages and many singles in this life. See, you're having to navigate your life right now in this over-sexualized culture that is screaming that you must experience sexual intimacy in order to be fulfilled. And it is just not true. That is a lie from the pit of hell meant to destroy you or if you are married, your marriage. See, Paul is saying you don't need that. And as we mentioned a moment ago, why? Because you have fellowship with the lover of your soul. And he can touch you to the depths in ways that physical experience could never do. You see, we know we have these natural and God-given desires, but more than your body is crying out for fulfillment, your soul is crying to be quenched with the presence of our King. And there's a day coming where we will see him face to face. So we long for that day. So whether you're single or married, you must hear that sexual experiences will never quench this desire that you think you have in you for more than a few minutes. It is not worth sacrificing your joy, your holiness, your purity, or your marriage over. Because in that way, it is enslaving you. See, that's what Paul has in mind in verse 23, whenever he said, you were bought with a price. Do not become a bondservant to men. He's reminding us that you were, you were, not only were you were purchased with the precious blood of King Jesus, and if you misplace any of that longing in you, that really is crying out for him, it will always find a way to enslave you. You will always be enslaved to something. See, some of us this morning are enslaved to many things that we need to be free of. And the only way to truly be free of the bondage that you still carry is full and everlasting contentment in Christ. It's the only answer. Christ is enough, like we sung a few moments ago. So we have a single gift we see a single contentment, and finally we end with a single purpose. So to put everything together, I believe what Paul is calling us is to see as his main exhortation is this. We must embrace our calling and find our contentment in Christ so that we can live with undistracted devotion to the Lord. Undistracted devotion. And to be clear, this is all of our calling. If you are in Christ, your primary purpose is to enjoy and exalt God to live with undistracted devotion to the Lord. However, Paul is telling us that singleness actually aids in pure and undistracted devotion to God. See, I believe this is the reason why Paul is using the language that it was better in many ways or preferred in many ways because when it comes to undistracted devotion to the Lord, being unmarried is better for that purpose than marriage. You see, we've seen him state this a few different ways already, but to bring in the rest of the chapter and where I'm getting this primarily from, we're not going to read this whole thing, but I put a summary slide up here for you. To, we see these through verses 28 through the end of the chapter in chapter 7. We see Paul say things like this. From verse 28, he says, marriage brings worldly troubles and distracts us from our devotion to the Lord. See, unmarried men and women can be solely devoted to the Lord. Verses 32 through 34. He says in verse 35, as we're tempted to, to kind of want to kick him in the throat or, or, or punch him sometimes, right? He, he reminds us in verse 35, lovingly, this is for your good. He said it's not to restrain you, but it's so that you can have right priorities and undivided devotion to the Lord. In verse 38, we could summarize it by saying, he says, if you marry, you do well. You really do. But if you don't, it's even better, Right? And then verse 40, he says, a widowed wife is happier if she remained as she is. And again, he's not talking about your circumstances or your situations. He is saying that your contentment is in Christ. And in that way, you can live with such an undivided devotion to the Lord that it is so much better. See, Paul, what he, what's he trying to do with all this language? 
He's trying to help the people in the church live with as little complications or distractions as possible so they can please the Lord to the best of their abilities and finding full satisfaction in Him. Haven't you felt that your life even today is busy? Doesn't it feel cluttered with so many distractions? So Paul is lovingly through these verses trying to, trying to show us what we face if we're in marriage or what we will face one day if we choose to be married. See, if you are single, you are called to use that for, your, for the purpose and will of our God. You have the unique ability to pursue and serve God in ways that unmarried people can't. I saw an article from Desiring God that I thought was really, really helpful for this. As I was trying to think of like practical ways of, of summarizing these advantages of singleness that Paul's calling it with undistracted devotion to the Lord. And it focused on three main areas that I thought were really helpful. The first one was focus and then flexibility and freedom. And the article talked about how uh, you can, f- with your focus, right, you have the uniquely enabled to focus on Jesus without distraction. In ways that, yes, marriage is a good gift, but it does split your devotion, your focus. Talked about your flexibility. Talked about how you can say yes more often to serving God and other people when you don't have to check with somebody else or run home to see somebody else. Talked about your freedom. You have the, the mobility and freedom to often do what married people cannot. You have the undistracted freedom to please God. The question is if you will embrace your singleness, find contentment for Christ and live with this focused, flexible, and free perspective. Because you can serve God with everything that you have. So this is the call to all who are single. What? Yeah, (laughs) Paul's raising the roof up here. Um, Well, we've experienced a lot of this in our own relationship. Paul is focused, flexible, and free in more ways than I could ever be. And he can serve the church in so many ways that I cannot. Yeah. However, especially if you were class your, classify yourself, as we talked about earlier, with a single that is desiring to be married, one final note for here. If God does choose to provide that for you in his timing, and hear me, I pray that he would. I pray that he would. You do not want to look back on this time like you spent it waiting and wasteful instead of joyful and obedient. That is the last thing you want to do looking back on this time. Don't let the adversary steal your joy and steal your purpose. And can I just say, we have some amazingly gifted singles at Cornerstone Church that lay down their lives for the good of this body. And I would never call any of them out by name in case it's an insensitive topic, but hear me, we are better and more beautiful because you are here. We look more like Jesus because so many of you embrace your singleness with faithfulness even when it's hard, even when it comes with its stuff. See, you truly are encouraging and building up the rest of us as we strive to follow you in pursuit of Jesus. See, I thought a way fitting to close this. The team wants to go ahead and start coming up. I came across this article from this book. It's a Christian writer that chooses singleness, and here's what he has to say about this topic. The good news about a single Savior who provides abundant life for all who die with him Jesus didn't view his celibacy as a no, no to joy, no to sex, no to intimacy, but rather he viewed it as a life-giving yes, a yes to relationships, a yes to friends, yes to serving others, and yes to enjoying life to the fullest. See, my prayer today, Cornerstone Church, is no matter what context we find ourselves in, that that we will be a people that will say yes to God. Let's live with undistracted devotion to him. Let's pray. Father, we are here for you. God, we long, no matter our circumstance or assignment in this life, to live with undistracted devotion to you, Father. God, you are worthy of it all. And God, for those of us that maybe are struggling this morning in our context, maybe those of us are single that are desiring to be married, maybe those of us are single that aren't really looking for marriage, but something's got us unsettled. For those of us that are married, Maybe we find our camp this morning with some of those people that thought the grass was greener on the other side of divorce. Maybe those of us this morning, Father, are chasing things of this world and it's exhausting and it's stilling our joy. Father, would you help us see that we are your beloved and what else could we need? Father, would you help us to give ourselves fully over to saying yes 
yes to life with you, yes to joy with you, yes to service with you, because we believe and we trust you more than our feelings, our own thoughts, or our own emotions. So God, I pray in these moments that we could just release any hardness of our heart, any conviction we felt, any, 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 any unhealthy emotions or feelings in our minds, any, anything that we're anxious or worried about, Lord, and when we stand in a moment and sing and just remind our souls that we are your beloved. And Father, I pray in a real way that it would wash away many of the, the berries, barriers, any hard soils of our hearts that we are carrying with us this morning, Father. God, would you forgive us if we've lacked faith in the calling and assignment you've given us? If we have failed to see wherever you have us right now is a good gift, and it's for a purpose. Father, we, we confess that to you. God, I know I've struggled in that with my own life, Lord, so we just lay that at your feet. God, help us not to be grass is greener on the other side, people, Father, but help us to follow you with reckless abandon. And we can only do that because you love us. In the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. Would you stand and sing with us?